Section 1 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 1 The Three Golden Apples. Part 1. Did you ever hear of the golden apples that grew in the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, these were such apples as would bring a great price by the bushel if any of them could be found growing in the orchards of nowadays. But there is not, I suppose, a graft of that wonderful fruit on a single tree in the wide world, not so much as a seed of those apples exists any longer. And even in the old, old, half-forgotten times before the garden of the Hesperides was overrun with weeds, and a great many people doubted whether there could be real trees that bore apples of solid gold upon their branches, all had heard of them, but nobody remembered to have seen any. Children nevertheless used to listen open-mouthed to stories of the golden apple tree, and resolved to discover it when they should be big enough. Adventurous young men who desired to do a braver thing than any of their fellows set out in quest of this fruit. Many of them returned no more. None of them brought back the apples. No wonder that they found it impossible to gather them. It is said that there was a dragon beneath the tree with a hundred terrible heads, fifty of which were always on the watch, while the other fifty slept. In my opinion, it was hardly worth running so much risk for the sake of a solid golden apple. Had the apples been sweet, mellow, and juicy, indeed, that would be another matter. There might then have been some sense in trying to get at them, in spite of the hundred-headed dragon. But as I have already told you, it was quite a common thing with young persons, when tired of too much peace and rest, to go in search of the garden of the Hesperides. Now, once the adventure was undertaken by a hero, who had enjoyed very little peace or rest since he came into the world. At the time of which I am going to speak, he was wandering through the pleasant land of Italy, with a mighty club in his hand, and a bow and quiver slung across his shoulders. He was wrapped in the skin of the biggest and fiercest lion that ever had been seen, and which he himself had killed, and though on the whole he was a kind and generous and noble man, there was a good deal of the lion's fierceness in his heart. As he went on his way, he continually inquired whether that were the right road to the famous garden. But none of the country people knew anything about the matter, and many looked as if they would have laughed at the question if the stranger had not carried so very big a club. And so he journeyed on and on, still making the same inquiry, until at last he came to the brink of a river where some beautiful young women sat twining wreaths of flowers. Can you tell me, pretty maidens, asked the stranger, whether this is the right way to the garden of the Hesperides? The young women had been having a fine time together, weaving the flowers into wreaths and crowning one another's heads, and there seemed to be a kind of magic in the touch of their fingers that made the flowers more fresh and dewy and of brighter hues and sweeter fragrance while they played with them than even when they had been growing on their native stems. But on hearing the stranger's question, they dropped all their flowers on the grass and gazed at him with astonishment. The garden of the Hesperides, cried one. We thought mortals had been weary of seeking it after so many disappointments, and pray, adventurous traveller, what do you want there? A certain king, who is my cousin, replied he, has ordered me to get him three of the golden apples. Most of the young men who go in quest of these apples, observed another of the damsels, desire to obtain them for themselves, or to present them to some fair maiden whom they love. Do you then love this king, your cousin, so very much? Perhaps not, replied the stranger, sighing. He has often been severe and cruel to me, but it is my destiny to obey him. And do you know, asked the damsel who had first spoken, that a terrible dragon with a hundred heads keeps watch under the golden apple tree? I know it well, answered the stranger calmly, but from my cradle upward it has been my business, and almost my pastime, to deal with serpents and dragons. The young women looked at his massive club, 
and at the shaggy lion skin which he wore and likewise at his heroic limbs and figure and they whispered to each other that the stranger appeared to be one who might reasonably expect to perform deeds far beyond the might of other men but then the dragon with a hundred heads what mortal even if he possessed a hundred lives could hope to escape the fangs of such a monster so kind-hearted were the maidens that they could not bear to see this brave and handsome traveler attempt what was so very dangerous and devote himself most probably to becoming a meal for the dragon's hundred ravenous mouths go back cried they all go back to your own home your mother beholding you safe and sound will shed tears of joy and what can she do more should you win ever so great a victory no matter for the golden apples no matter for the king your cruel cousin we do not wish the dragon with a hundred heads to eat you up the stranger seemed to grow impatient at these remonstrances he carelessly lifted his mighty club and let it fall upon a rock that lay half buried in the earth nearby with the force of that idle blow the great rock was shattered all to pieces it cost the stranger no more effort to achieve this feat of a giant's strength than for one of the young maidens to touch her sister's rosy cheek with a flower do you not believe said he looking at the damsels with a smile that such a blow would have crushed one of the dragon's hundred heads then he sat down on the grass and told them the story of his life or as much of it as he could remember from the day when he was first cradled in a warrior's brazen shield and while he lay there two immense serpents came gliding over the floor and opened their hideous jaws to devour him and he a baby of a few months old had gripped one of the fierce snakes in each of his little fists and strangled them to death when he was but a stripling he had killed a huge lion almost as big as the one whose vast and shaggy hide he now wore upon his shoulders the next thing that he had done was to fight a battle with an ugly sort of monster called a hydra which had no less than nine heads and exceedingly sharp teeth in every one but the dragon of the hesperides you know observed one of the damsels has a hundred heads nevertheless replied the stranger i would rather fight two such dragons than a single hydra for as fast as i cut off a head two others grew in its place and besides there was one of the heads that could not possibly be killed but kept biting as fiercely as ever long after it was cut off so i was forced to bury it under a stone where it is doubtless alive to this very day but the hydra's body and its eight other heads will never do any further mischief the damsels judging that the story was likely to last a good while had been preparing a repast of bread and grapes that the stranger might refresh himself in the intervals of his talk they took pleasure in helping him to this simple food and now and then one of them would put a sweet grape between her rosy lips lest it should make him bashful to eat alone the traveler proceeded to tell her he had chased a very swift stag for a twelve month together without ever stopping to take breath and had at last caught it by the antlers and carried it home alive and he had fought with a very odd race of people half horses and half men and had put them all to death from a sense of duty in order that their ugly figures might never be seen any more besides all this he took to himself great credit for having cleaned out a stable do you call that a wonderful exploit asked one of the young maidens with a smile any clown in the country has done as much had it been an ordinary stable replied the stranger I should not have mentioned it but this was so gigantic a task that it would have taken me all of my life to perform it if i had not luckily thought of turning the channel of a river through the stable door that did the business in a very short time seeing how earnestly his fair auditors listened he next told them how he had shot some monstrous birds and had caught a wild bull alive and let him go again and had tamed a number of very wild horses and had conquered hippolyte the warlike queen of the amazons he mentioned likewise that he had taken off hippolyte's enchanted girdle and had given it to the daughter of his cousin the king was it the girdle of venus inquired the prettiest of the damsels which makes women beautiful no answered the stranger 
It had formerly been the sword belt of Mars, and it can only make the wearer valiant and courageous. An old sword belt, cried the damsel, tossing her head. Then I should not care about having it. You are right, said the stranger. Going on with his wonderful narrative, he informed the maidens that as strange an adventure as ever happened was when he had fought with Geryon, the six-legged man. This was a very odd and frightful sort of figure. As you may well believe, any person looking at his tracks in the sand or snow would suppose that three sociable companions had been walking along together. On hearing his footsteps at a little distance, it was no more than reasonable to judge that several people must be coming. But it was only the strange man Geryon clattering onward with his six legs. Six legs and one gigantic body. Certainly he must have been a very queer monster to look at, and my stars, what a waste of shoe leather. When the stranger had finished the story of his adventures, he looked around at the attentive faces of the maidens. Perhaps you may have heard of me before, said he modestly. My name is Hercules. We had already guessed it, replied the maidens, for your wonderful deeds are known all over the world. We do not think it strange any longer that you should set out in quest of the golden apples of the Hesperides. Come, sisters, let us crown the hero with flowers. Then they flung beautiful wreaths over his stately head and mighty shoulders, so that the lion's skin was almost entirely covered with roses. They took possession of his ponderous club, and so entwined it about with the brightest, softest, and most fragrant blossoms, that not a finger's breadth of its oaken substance could be seen. It looked all like a huge bunch of flowers. Lastly, they joined hands and danced around him, chanting words which became poetry of their own accord, and grew into a choral song in honor of the illustrious Hercules. And Hercules was rejoiced, as any other hero would have been, to know that these fair young girls had heard of the valiant deeds which it had cost him so much toil and danger to achieve. But still he was not satisfied. He could not think that what he had already done was worthy of so much honor while there remained any bold or difficult adventure to be undertaken. Dear maidens, said he, when they paused to take breath, now that you know my name, will you not tell me how I am to reach the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, must you go so soon, they exclaimed, you that have performed so many wonders and spent such a toilsome life, cannot you content yourself to repose a little while on the margin of this peaceful river? Hercules shook his head. I must depart now, said he. We will then give you the best directions we can, replied the damsels. You must go to the seashore and find out the old one, and compel him to inform you where the golden apples are to be found. The old one, repeated Hercules, laughing at this odd name, and pray, who may the old one be? Why, the old man of the sea, to be sure, answered one of the damsels. He has fifty daughters, whom some people call very beautiful but we do not think it proper to be acquainted with them, because they have sea-green hair and taper away like fishes. You must talk with this old man of the sea. He is a seafaring person, and knows all about the garden of the Hesperides, for it is situated in an island which he is often in the habit of visiting. Hercules then asked the whereabouts the old one was most likely to be met with. When the damsels had informed him, he thanked them for all their kindness, for the bread and grapes with which they had fed him, the lovely flowers with which they had crowned him, and the songs and dances wherewith they had done him honor. And he thanked them most of all for telling him the right way, and immediately set forth upon his journey. But before he was out of hearing, one of the maidens called after him. Keep fast hold of the old one when you catch him, cried she, smiling, and lifting her finger to make the caution more impressive. Do not be astonished at anything that may happen, only hold him fast, and he will tell you what you wish to know. Hercules again thanked her, and pursued his way, while the maidens resumed their pleasant labor of making flower wreaths. They talked about the hero long after he was gone. 
We will crown him with the loveliest of our garlands, said they, when he returns hither with the three golden apples, after slaying the dragon with a hundred heads. Meanwhile Hercules travelled constantly onward over hill and dale, and through the solitary woods. Sometimes he swung his club aloft, and splintered a mighty oak with a downright blow. His mind was so full of the giants and monsters with whom it was the business of his life to fight, that perhaps he mistook the great tree for a giant or a monster. And so eager was Hercules to achieve what he had undertaken, that he almost regretted to have spent so much time with the damsels, wasting idle breath upon the story of his adventures. But thus it always is with persons who are destined to perform great things. What they have already done seems less than nothing. What they have taken in hand to do seems worth toil, danger, and life itself. Persons who happened to be passing through the forest must have been affrighted to see him smite the trees with his great club. With but a single blow, the trunk was riven as by the stroke of lightning, and the broad boughs came rustling and crashing down. Hastening forward without ever pausing or looking behind, he by and by heard the sea roaring at a distance. At this sound he increased his speed, and soon came to a beach where the great surf waves tumbled themselves upon the hard sand in a long line of snowy foam. At one end of the beach, however, there was a pleasant spot where some green shrubbery clambered up a cliff, making its rocky face look soft and beautiful. A carpet of verdant grass, largely intermixed with sweet-smelling clover, covered the narrow space between the bottom of the cliff and the sea. And what should Hercules espy there but an old man fast asleep? But was it really and truly an old man? Certainly at first sight it looked very like one, but on closer inspection it rather seemed to be some kind of a creature that lived in the sea, for on his legs and arms there were scales, such as fishes have. He was web-footed and web-fingered after the fashion of a duck and his long beard, being of a greenish tinge, had more the appearance of a tuft of seaweed than of an ordinary beard. Have you never seen a stick of timber that has been long tossed about by the waves, and has got all overgrown with barnacles, and at last drifting ashore, seems to have been thrown up from the very deepest bottom of the sea? Well, the old man would have put you in mind of just a wave-tossed spar. But Hercules, the instant he set eyes on this strange figure, was convinced it could be no other than the old one who was to direct him on his way. Yes, it was the self-same old man of the sea whom the hospitable maidens had talked to him about. Thanking his stars for the lucky accident of finding the old fellow asleep, Hercules stole on tiptoe towards him and caught him by the arm and leg. Tell me! cried he before the old one was well awake, which is the way to the garden of the Hesperides? As you may easily imagine, the old man of the sea awoke in a fright, but his astonishment could hardly have been greater than was that of Hercules the next moment, for all of a sudden the old one seemed to disappear out of his grasp, and he found himself holding a stag by the fore and hind leg, but still he kept fast hold. Then the stag disappeared, and in its stead there was a seabird, fluttering and screaming, while Hercules clutched it by the wing and claw. But the bird could not get away. Immediately afterward there was an ugly three-headed dog, which growled and barked at Hercules, and snapped fiercely at the hands by which he held him. But Hercules would not let him go. In another minute, instead of the three-headed dog, what should appear but the Geryon, the six-legged man-monster, kicking at Hercules with five of his legs, in order to get the remaining one at liberty. But Hercules held on. By and by, no Geryon was there but a huge snake, like one of those which Hercules had strangled in his babyhood, only a hundred times as big and it twisted and twined about the hero's neck and body, and threw its tail high into the air, and opened its deadly jaws as if to devour him outright, so that it was really a very terrible spectacle. But Hercules was no whit disheartened, and squeezed the great snake so tightly that he soon began to hiss with pain. 
End of section one.